want to talk to you today about how to overcome temptation. Overcoming temptation. And here's the thing about temptation. Uh, you and I are always going to deal with temptation until we die. Uh, we're never going to outgrow it. And if you're like, how do you know I'm not going to outgrow temptation? You're never going to mature beyond being tempted. And here's how I know that. Because Jesus was tempted and you're not going to outgrow him. Does this make sense? All right, you're never like going to get past the maturity of Jesus. And so temptation is going to be part of our lives for the rest of our lives. And here's the interesting thing about temptation. Uh, we are tempted both in our strengths and our weaknesses. Uh, usually people, when they think about temptation, they think about it just in the realm of weaknesses. But the truth is you're tempted in the realm of your strengths as well. There's two types of sin. There's the sin of commission, and there's the sin of omission. Usually the sin of commission is in the realm of our weaknesses. It's things that we commit. Uh, it's things that we shouldn't do, but we do them. But then the other category is usually in the realm of our strengths. It's, it's omission. Instead of using our strengths for the glory of God and for his purposes, uh, we use them for, for selfish reasons. And temptation is always going to be part of our lives. So we're continuing our series today called King and Cross, walking through the book of Mark together. And if you brought your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we're going to read a little bit of what I shared last weekend. By the way, if you weren't here last weekend, would you please go online and watch and listen to that sermon for two reasons. Uh, one is I think it will help you personally. And two, I uh, talked about some big theological things last, last weekend, but it's kind of what undergirds a lot of things that we do here at Sun Valley. And so if you missed last weekend, please go online and watch and listen to that sermon. But we'll start in Mark chapter 1, verse 9, the baptism of Jesus, and then we'll continue on. Let's dive right in. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. The Bible says, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John, that's John the Baptist, in the Jordan River. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Holy Spirit, anytime you see a capital S in the Bible talking about spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit descending on him, what's the next word? What's the next word, everybody? All locations. Like. And I know that word doesn't look really important, but it's really important. The Holy Spirit descending on him, what does it say? Like a dove. Everybody listen. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit is a dove. And I know you've seen stained glass windows and all of that. But what Mark writes here is the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus. What? Like a dove. And then the Father speaks. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son. Whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. I talk about that verse on Christmas Eve. If you're a dad here this morning, all of your kids need that from you. They need to know from you, dads, even I'm 50. Even if your, your kid is 50 years old, they need to hear from you. you. You belong. You're my kid. I love you. And I'm pleased with you. You're special to me. It's something all children need to know. So the Father speaks over the Son. The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. It's this beautiful moment. And then Mark writes this. At once. Immediately. This beautiful moment. And then at once. The Holy Spirit sent Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days. He was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Okay, this is really, really interesting. If you read through the biographies of Jesus in the New Testament, 
So those are the first four books of the New Testament. If you've never read the Bible before, that's where you want to start. In fact, uh, here at the church, we're walking through uh, the book of Mark. It'll take us all the way through Easter. Uh, we're we're going to kind of lay a foundation over the next few weeks, and then we're going to kind of move quickly through the book of Mark all the way to celebrating Easter together. If you've never read the Bible before, just read the book of Mark with us. You can download the Sun Valley app. There's verses for every day, Monday through Friday in the book of Mark, so check it out. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the biographies of Jesus. And these biographies have different details. For example, in the book of Mark, uh, you won't find anything about Christmas. If you read the book of Mark, you won't read anything about Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the baby Jesus. Mark starts right with Jesus's ministry. John the Baptist is the forerunner, and boom, Jesus is getting baptized, and off we go. And so the different books have different details about the life of, of Jesus. But every one of them talk about the baptism of Jesus. And what's interesting is, three out of the four, it goes from baptism to immediately, or to at once, Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. By the way, when it says wilderness there, it's not talking about forest and trees and rivers, right? It's, it, it's not some beautiful place. The wilderness here is the desert. It is a barren land. And so here's, here's what we just read. Put this together. Here's what we just read. This beautiful moment where the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. This beautiful moment where the Father says, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. It's this beautiful moment of Jesus' baptism, and then he moves right into battle. From beauty to battle in a verse. From a place of great comfort to a place of great conflict. Just like that. From a place of great strength, right? Affirmation. Strength to, to a place of, of struggle. Let's just go all the way there. Jesus is moved from hearing a voice from heaven to hearing a voice from hell. Like, like in a verse. So I'll, I'll just ask you this morning, why, why do you think that is? It's for a few reasons, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna unpack this with you over the next few minutes. But I think one of the reasons, it's because that's how life is. Have you noticed? Have you ever had like this beautiful moment in your life and then like the next day, boom, has that ever happened? Let me just tell you this truth because sometimes we listen to TV preachers or podcasts or, or, or whatever and we have this idea that if I follow Jesus, right, it's all gonna be good from here on out. Let me just tell you this, life's gonna be hard. Life is hard for everybody, all right? And there's a fight to be fought in the Christian life. You may have never thought about this. Life was hard for Jesus. For example, he has to be in the desert for 40 days. And other passages of scripture say that he's going to be fasting for 40 days. That ain't easy. Life is hard for Jesus. And I'll just tell you this. Life was harder for Jesus when you look at the scope of everything he did in his time on earth. Life was harder for Jesus than it's ever going to be for you and for me. He's been through more difficult things than you and I will ever, will ever face. And, and yet you and I have this idea, right? If life is hard, then God's mad at us. Or if life is good, then, then God's happy with us. And the reason that person's struggling and I'm not is because I'm good and they're bad. Friends, that's, that's, not what the Bible, that's not what the Bible teaches. I mean, God speaks over Jesus. You belong, you are loved, you are special. Go into battle. <laughs> And God speaks over my life and yours. If you've given your life to Jesus, you're a child of God. And God speaks over you. You belong. You are loved. You are special. But life's still going to be hard. If you are new today, and I'm up here talking about Christianity, and I'm saying that it's going to be hard, you might be thinking to yourself, dude, you're not selling this very well. <laughs> uh, that's because I'm not selling anything. Uh, it's, it's just the truth of life. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. How many of you have found that to be true? All locations, and you help a brother out? Yeah. But then Jesus said this, but take heart. I have overcome the world. 
Life is going to be difficult in, in two ways. We're going to talk about one of them today. Uh, sometimes you're going to experience trials. Uh, trials in life are there for your training. Trials are, are, about, are about testing. And sometimes in life we're going to go through trials and, and you're going to be tested. And, and that's for our good. It's, it's to train us up. I've been through a lot of trials in, in life. And, and looking back, it's those seasons when I chose to, to grow through what I was going through, it was those seasons where God matured me the most. And I have been through trials and I will go through trials, right? That, that's, that's just life. And so sometimes we go through trials and, and sometimes that even comes from God to train us up and to, and to help us grow. But at other times, we're going to experience great temptations. Trials are from God to train us up. Temptations are from the evil one, or they come from our own sinful nature, and they're there to trip us up, to, to trick us. Now, sometimes when you, when you read the Bible, the Bible, the New Testament specifically, written in Greek originally, and it's translated into English. And sometimes those terms, trials and temptations, are kind of interchangeable, okay? But, but listen to what I'm saying principally. Trials are there to train us. Temptations are there to, to trip us up, to, to trick us, to to destroy us. And today I want to talk to you about overcoming temptation. And all of us are going to experience temptation. And we're going to experience it for the rest of our lives. And so, let's learn how to win that battle. Three things in your notes today. You can follow along with me on the Sun Valley app. Or you can write these things down if you want to do that. Uh, first thing about these five verses of scripture that we just read. Number one, Jesus is changing everything. Jesus is changing everything. And this is really, really important in the realm of temptation because I, I, I need to make a connection for you. I'm going to give you this quickly, so just, just hang on tight. So Mark writes that God speaks from heaven, and so the Father is speaking. He writes that the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove, and then, of course, you have Jesus in the Jordan River. That's the Trinity represented right here at the baptism of Jesus. I talked a lot about that last weekend. Again, you can go online and watch and listen to that sermon. But think about this for a moment. If you grew up in church and you grew up in Sunday school, think about the first chapter of the Bible. I'm going to quote the first verse of the Bible. It's Genesis 1.1. Here's what it says. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. By the way, if you've never memorized a verse, that one's easy. I taught that one to my kids when they were like six years old. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you read through Genesis chapter one, here's what's happening. Listen close. God is speaking and the universe is being created. And the Holy Spirit, it says, is hovering over the waters. Now, fast forward to the baptism of Jesus. God is speaking, and the Holy Spirit is hovering over the waters like a dove. Do you see a correlation there? Now, for you and I, we read that, and we think, Holy Spirit, dove, absolutely. We've seen the stained glass windows, all that kind of thing. Holy Spirit, dove, yeah, 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 yeah. But for these people, at the time that Mark wrote this, he's making a connection. When rabbis would teach Genesis chapter 1, and God created the heavens and the earth, God speaks and things are being created, here's how they would teach it. And the Spirit, listen to this, fluttered over the waters like a dove. And that's what Mark is echoing here. He's saying, don't you see, don't you see, there's something happening on a cosmic level, even in the realm of creation. Like something new is coming. There's a new creation coming, and it's coming with the person of Jesus. God spoke, Genesis 1. God speaks here in Mark 1. The Holy Spirit flutters over the waters, Genesis 1. The Holy Spirit flutters like a dove over Jesus in the Jordan River, Mark 1. He's making this connection. Jesus changes everything. Now think about this for a moment. Jesus was bringing the ways of heaven to the earth. So big picture, the world is broken. Can we all agree on that? The weather's broken, although it's going to be pretty good today. The weather's broken, right? There's all kinds of things that happen. Uh, our political system is broken. I thought I'd get an amen right there, but no. <laughs> last night people cheering, you know. 
political system is, is, is broken. Um, just to be really honest, I'm broken. I mean, New Year's resolutions, all that. I can't keep up with my own standard, much less God's. Okay, so, so the world is broken. And what happened was, in Genesis 1, God creates the heavens and the earth. He creates uh, man, Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman. And it goes from creation to temptation. And listen, Adam and Eve failed the test. And as a result, the world is broken. Jesus is called the second Adam in your Bible. Notice that Genesis goes from creation to temptation. And here's what we just read. We went from an opportunity for new creation in and through the second Adam, the person of Jesus Christ, and it goes from new creation to what? Temptation. It's an echo. It's an echo. And the temptation on Jesus is much more difficult than the temptation on Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are in a perfect garden. They have one command. There's one tree in the garden. Just don't eat of that one. Everything else belongs to you. And I always think to myself, you know, why was Eve even hanging around that tree that day? Like, was the garden that small? Like, like here's the tree, right? And you're like, don't look at it. There it is again, right? <laughs> kind of, kind of do. I mean, it's a huge garden, and she's over there hanging around by it, right? Satan's going to speak to Eve. She fails the test, Adam fails the test. Satan's gonna speak to Jesus, but Jesus is not in a garden. Jesus is in the barren wilderness and he hadn't eaten for 40 days. It's hard, it's difficult, it's different. But Jesus is gonna bring in a new creation, the ways of heaven into the world. I'm going to give you a few ideas, and then we're going to keep going. I'm going to give you some practical things about temptation. But just think about how Jesus has changed the world. And if you're here today, and you're not a Christian, you're not sure what you believe, somebody cute invited you, you know, whatever, I'm so glad that you're here. Perhaps you've never thought about what I'm about to say. And if you're here today, and you've been in church your whole life, right, perhaps you've never thought about what, what I'm about to say. You realize that the great values, let's just go with Western culture, of the Western world, they all come from Jesus. They didn't exist prior to him. So let me give you the ways of heaven. Listen close. The ways of heaven are you leverage your power for the powerless. You leverage your wealth for those in need. You leverage your influence for those that do not have a voice. In the first century, in the time of Jesus... People leverage their power for more power. People leverage their wealth for more wealth. People leveraged their influence for more influence. Let's put it together. All charities that help people, you can trace that idea all the way back to Jesus. Did not exist prior to him. Because in the ancient world, if you were hopeless and helpless and your family didn't take care of you, your life was kind of over. There were no organizations that would give, get together to take care of you and give generously. And then all of a sudden you have this thing called the, called the church. They'd never seen that before. And it was a group of Jesus followers, Christians. The term Christian means little Christ. The world looked at these people and went, you guys are acting like Jesus. You're like little Jesus juniors. You're Christians, you're Christians. And they were radically generous. And that's why the church exploded in growth in the first century. Because they gave to, hear these words from Acts 2, anyone as they had need. Okay, let's go all the way there. You can trace handicapped parking <laughs> back to Jesus. Now, for all of you who are investigating faith, handicapped parking does not come from evolution and survival of the fittest. Think with me. That's not survival of the fittest. That's let's, let's help somebody that's, that's in need. That comes from Jesus. In, in the first century, it, if you had a child that had some kind of physical defect in some way, you would take your child to the dump and discard them. That's a fact. And Christians would go out and get your child and adopt them into their home and raise them up in the Lord. Because life is important to followers of Jesus. Women's rights, equality for women. You know where that comes from? Jesus. 
And people take verses out of the Bible that they don't understand and they use them out of context. Oh, the Bible's oppressive to women. No, it's not. You go anywhere in the world where biblical Christianity is practiced and it's good for women. If you're thinking, oh, I don't know if that's true. Okay, then here's what I want you to do. Get on a plane today and fly to the Middle East and hang out in a Muslim country for a while. And let me just ask you, what's that like for women? The Western world was radically changed because of the teachings of Jesus. And in the time of Jesus, women are sitting at his feet learning, and he's a rabbi. That had never happened before. Quickly, Mary and Martha. You remember this story from the scriptures? Those of you who went to Sunday school, if you don't, I'm, I'm going to just give you the bottom line here. They're sisters. Martha's like type A, working in the kitchen, going nuts, right? Mary sitting, hear these words, sitting at the feet of Jesus. That language in Greek is she's there as a student. Jesus is, is teaching. She's, she's, she's learning, right? And then Martha gets upset at her because she's, she's not helping me in the kitchen. And Jesus is like, um, I'm offering you something better out here. Martha, come out here and let me teach you too. Okay? The first person to see the resurrected Jesus was Mary Magdalene, a woman. She goes back to tell the men. Uh, equality, women's rights, empowering women, that comes from Jesus. I'll give you one more. Racial reconciliation comes from Jesus. Did not exist prior to him. The whole idea that you would even think about that did not exist. The abolition of slavery comes from Jesus. And people take the Bible and they pull verses out of context that they don't understand. And they, oh, and people have abused the Bible. And by the way, there's no jerks for Jesus. There's just jerks. And people have used the Bible as a weapon for their own means throughout the ages. But just know this. Racial reconciliation came from Jesus. The abolition of slavery came from Jesus. There was a man named William Wilberforce in Great Britain. He had power and wealth and influence. And he leveraged it to abolish slavery. He felt like God called him to the ministry. Not to be a pastor, but to be a politician. Talk about a rough calling. And he worked behind the scenes with his power, wealth, and influence and he got the slave trade abolished in Great Britain. People in America, like Abraham Lincoln and others, were inspired by that. And slavery was abolished in our country as well. Friends, Jesus changed the world. And we talk about temptation. See, the, the sin of omission that you and I are tempted to is to be selfish. To use our power for us. To use our wealth for us. To use our influence for us. But the ways of the kingdom of heaven... Or you use your power to serve. You use your wealth to give. You use your influence to speak up for those who do not have a voice. Do you see the difference? Jesus is ushering in the ways of heaven. And as his followers, we're to usher that in as well. So there's this great temptation to ignore the kingdom of heaven. Secondly, temptation overall is always about trust. Here in your notes, temptation is always about trust. In the beginning... Adam and Eve choose to trust the other voice. So instead of trusting the voice of God, they trust the voice of the serpent of Satan, and they fail the test. If you read in the other Gospels and, and you break down the temptations of Jesus here in the wilderness, and by the way, Jesus would be tempted by Satan for the rest of his life. This is just a, a big moment, okay? In this 40 days in the wilderness. But all of it is in the realm of trust. Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to trust? Who are we going to trust? Temptation for you and temptation for me is about who are we going to trust. And so let me give you three ways to, to begin to overcome temptation. And these are not going to be on the screen. This is kind of extra. You can write it to the side. The first thing if you're going to overcome temptation is you have to have a proactive plan. A proactive plan. So temptation is a battle. And anytime you're going to go to battle, you have to have a plan to win the battle. Make sense? So you're thinking ahead of time. For example, if you have temptations that, that seem to come about on the computer, right? What's some safe software you can put on there? Uh, for years, there, there was software that, that I've used. It's called Safe Eyes. Anybody ever heard of that? There, there's several. That's the one I'm going to mention. But that software to where's a 50-year-old dude, right? And, 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 and the, the powers that be know that I'm a 50-year-old dude. So they have all kinds of things that they think I might be interested in, right? <laughs> and so what Safe Eyes does is it blocks those images from ever getting to me. Make sense? So I've defeated it before it ever got to me. Okay? You have to proactively plan. If you cheat on your taxes right, and you have a tendency to kind of bend a little bit and lie a little bit, then here's what you do. You just hire an accountant to do your taxes. And then it's not a temptation for you. 
Proactive planning. I'm going to be really vulnerable with you. One of the things that uh, Katrina and I do is, is we have this question that we ask each other. And the question is this. Do you have anything in the file? Here's what the file is. The file is things I can't talk to her about. Or things I don't want her to know about. Is everybody with me? Don't look around right now. Just look at me. I'll keep you safe. <laughs> All right. So she has full permission to say, Chad, is there anything in the file? And my commitment to her is to be honest, right? And so every once in a while, just say, hey, got anything in the file, right? Or I can ask her, hey, you got anything in the file? I, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you one thing, proactive. Um, if I'm ever attracted to another woman, I have to tell Katrina about it. That's the proactive commitment. So let me explain something here. Attraction is not sin. You're going to be attracted to people. Can I get a witness? Again, don't look around right now. <laughs> Okay, somebody beautiful walks by, right? Beautiful woman, you're going to notice. Beautiful man, you're going to notice. Okay, attraction is not sin. It's when you take that attraction and you start to dwell on it and it moves from attraction to lust, now you're in the realm of sin. Make sense? So, like, if you're a 15-year-old boy, you're going to be attracted all the time. Not a sin. <laughs> okay, you are walking around, you don't even see anybody and you're attracted. I have about 18 jokes right now, and I'm keeping all of them. In. <laughs> no! <laughs> okay. Um, you and I have to learn, right? Learn to control ourselves and, and to deal with those things. So if there's somebody that I meet at work or in the reality of life that's attractive, and, and I'm feeling something in the air. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You do. Don't look around right now. You know. And I'm like, ooh, when I'm around here, there's like something in the air. What I do is I tell my wife about that. And some of you guys are like, dude, really? <laughs> yeah. Because you know what that does between Katrina and I? Listen. And she tells me if she has that. It builds trust. You're like, well, don't you guys trust each other? Yes, because we're building it. And we try to do things that, that build trust and, and, not, and not break it. Go all the way there. Because if I tell her, I'm leaving no room for fantasy. I'm keeping it in the realm of reality. Because when I tell my wife, it just got real. <laughs> Make sense? And she gets that and she's compassionate towards me about that. And, and we proactively plan to defeat any temptations that might come along. Okay? I, I, I've been just as real as I can possibly be with you. But you, you've got to think about those things Listen, and you got to fight the good fight. Now, some of us have addictions and things that are just killing us, and we have a ministry called Celebrate Recovery that will help you. And so I want to introduce that to you. This is Mark, who helps lead that ministry. Watch this. Hello, I'm a grateful follower of Jesus. I struggle with alcohol and drugs. I'm the recovery pastor for Sun Valley Community Church. My name is Mark. So I got sober in Alcoholics Anonymous in... November 22nd, 2005, um, sober a couple of years um, when I was introduced to Celebrate Recovery here at Sun Valley Community Church. And, um, and that was kind of the missing link in my recovery program. I had been uh, drinking and drugging literally since I've been 14 years old. I always tell people that Alcoholics Anonymous saved my life and Celebrate Recovery saved my heart. And it still does to this day. So Celebrate Recovery is a place where you can find freedom from your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups as we meet, know, and follow Jesus. And Celebrate Recovery is for anybody. It's for everybody. Um, a, a lot of people are under the illusion that um, Celebrate Recovery is for alcoholics and drug addicts only. Um, and that's just not true. Only 20% of the people there are st struggle with alcohol and drugs. The other 80% is everything else. And that could be mental issues, it could be abuse, it could be physical abuse, mental abuse, um, definitely sexual integrity for men and for women, uh, codependency, um, and the list can go on and on. There's a lot of people there at Celebrate Recovery is going to understand your story. Um, and there's so much hope in it. As a matter of fact, when you show up to Celebrate Recovery, the one thing that I can guarantee you that you will have by the time you leave is a little teeny piece of hope. If you're dealing with a hurt, habit, or a hang-up, come to Celebrate Recovery. You'll find freedom, healing, and most importantly, you'll find hope. Please come join us at Celebrate Recovery.
years ago when I met Mark, I said, hey, why are you here? He goes, oh, because I'm allergic to alcohol. I said, you're allergic to alcohol? He goes, yeah, anytime I drink, I break out in handcuffs. <laughs> and I was like, I love you, man. Welcome to Sun Valley. You're in the right place. Um, sometimes we, we, we have things that we just go back to over and over again. And if we can just keep it real right now, a bunch of us here today have stuff like that. Celebrate Recovery will help you. As Mark said, it's not just for people with chemical issues. Uh, I've gone through uh, the steps of recovery twice, uh, and neither time was it about drugs or alcohol. It's about other things in my life. And so I want to encourage you to take that step. You can go to cr.sv.cc. Uh, all the times and locations are there, uh, but that will, that will help you. So you got to have a proactive plan to beat temptation. Uh, some of us, just out to the side of your notes, uh, you just got to resist it. And there's a bunch of us, if I can keep it real with you, you're not resisting at all. Um, you're just doing some things, you're not even thinking about it. And I'll just tell you, uh, over time, that's going to kill you. And you don't even know it. Uh, the reason that we sin is because we like it. The reason that we sin is because it makes us happy. You're like, I've never heard a pastor say that. Listen, we don't sin because we hate it. We sin because we like it. But here's the thing about sin. It'll make you happy in a moment, but it'll rob the joy that God has for you for a lifetime. Because there are massive consequences to it. It always takes you farther than you want to go, keeps you longer than you want to stay, and it always costs you more than you want to pay. I heard one pastor say it this way. You want to be killing sin or sin will be killing you. The reason that God hates sin is because he loves you and me. And all of God's laws and all of his precepts are for our good. So you want to proactively plan, you want to resist. There's some type of sin, you just want to run from it. You just want to run. You don't fight it, you don't resist it, you just run. Um, I, I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to say this, so I'm going to say this. I don't want to be weird about that, but... So some of you right now, if you got somebody in your life that you're attracted to and they're not your spouse, just hurt their feelings. Just run. Just upset them, hurt their feelings for their good, for yours, and more importantly, for the good of your family and for your legacy. There are some things you just run from because you can't resist it. It's too strong. It's too powerful. Take the step of recovery. That confession is the first step, and you're like, oh, it's pretty bad. I promise you somebody in Celebrate Recovery, their story is going to trump yours. I know because I've gone. There's some, there's some stories. Resist. Run. Uh, one of the things I want for everybody here at Sun Valley is real friendships. Confession is most powerful when you confess the sin you're thinking about doing. And so when you and I have real friends and we're talking about what's really going on in our hearts and minds and that friend's trying to follow Jesus too, it, it helps us. All these things are for our, our good. Third thing here in your notes, and this is kind of the, the thing that, that helps us overcome temptation at large. Number three here, because temptation is a trust issue. If we could see what God sees, then we would always do what God says. If we could see what God sees, then we would always do what God says. Everybody look at me here. Our problem is not that we don't love God enough. Our problem is we don't realize how much he loves us. Because all of his rules and all of his precepts, everything he says, listen, is, is for our, our good. If we could see what he sees, we, we, we would always do what he says. And so the more that we understand, listen, the more that we understand what God spoke over Jesus, he speaks over you and me as his children, that we belong, that we are loved, that we are special. The more that we understand that, the more equipped we are to overcome and defeat temptation. Because his commands and what he tells us is for our good. When he tells us to give and to serve and those kinds of things, that is for our good. When he tells us to resist some things, that is for our good good. All of it is because he loves us. So creation, temptation. And Jesus would be tempted for the rest of his life. The greatest temptation, catch this, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, would be in a garden. 
For Adam and Eve, it was in a garden. They failed. For Jesus, it would be in a garden. And for both of them, it's about a tree. For Adam and Eve, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For Jesus, God's will is go to the tree and die for all sin for all time. And Jesus passed the test. Not my will, but Father, yours be done. You know what you call that? Love. He loves you. One of the greatest prayers you can pray is, Father, help me to see what you see so that I might do what you, what you say. And let's trust him. And in that, overcome temptation. Would you guys pray with me? Let's pray together. Father, right now, um, as you well know, there are a bunch of us that are facing all kinds of temptations. And I pray that you would give us wisdom to overcome. Some of us today, uh, we just need to wake up. Today's our wake-up call. Shake us. Don't let us sleep tonight until we deal with it. Save us from our own destruction by our own dumb decisions. There's a bunch of us we need to go to recovery. I pray that we would trust you. There's a bunch of us we need to just confess something to somebody we love and trust. I pray that we would trust you. Father, some of us just need to start resisting. And may we live lives that are pleasing to you because in that we experience the most joy in our relationship with you. Teach us, we pray. Give us wisdom, we pray. And in that, may we experience the freedom that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen.